Welcome back to Watch Is Live. It's the only live show we shoot, so you are in the right place. If you're watching, the only live show on Watchbox Reviews, and of course, the people who pay for these pixels, thewatchbox.com. Pull down the shopping tab, go to New Arrivals. It will be your new favorite website. Check it daily. And they pay my salary. You can help subsidize yours truly. But tonight we have an incredible array of watches, and if there's a theme tonight, I would say it's probably precious metal versus base metals. Let's get started with something precious and over the top. We have Eddie Landsberg, a fan of the show and a frequent in our live chat box in the studio tonight. And I was just showing him this, the Ulysse Nardin Freak Cruiser. Now the original Freak came out in 2001 and it was significant for a bunch of reasons. Carousel Tourbillon, unconventional bezel setting system, case back winding, a direct impulse escapement, and the first pioneering use of silicon in a watch movement. It was different in every way. What it wasn't was water resistant. For 2013 and the Freak Cruiser you see right here, we had the first ever water resistant Freak. Surprisingly slender at 13.2 millimeters and just under 50 millimeters lug to lug. I'm going to throw this one on the wrist, but first let's get close to the dial. Now if you've never seen a Freak before, I should mention that this is known as a carousel. It was invented by Dane Bonabonixon in the 1890s, and unlike a tourbillon, there is a separate drive for the escapement as well as the carriage, so you can actually lift the tab down at 6 o'clock. You lift the tab to unlock the bezel, and now, because there is a separate drive for the escapement and the baguette style caliber, that is the carriage, I can move it without crashing the movement. And I am setting the minute. You'll note the hour hand moves very slowly. The full movement basically is the minute hand. It's a baguette style. It's called caliber 201, free sprung balance, 28 8 beat rate. You can see the twin direct impulse silicon escape wheels, a magnetic silicon hairspring, and then beautifully decorated with the anchor, which is the nautical motif to remind you that Ulysse Norden was a renowned creator of marine chronometers in the 19th and early 20th centuries. So you've seen how you set the watch. Now I'm going to show you how you wind the watch. First, you lock it in place by pressing the tab down, turn it all over, and you can see the case back is essentially your crown. You use it to wind the watch. Turn it in place, and you can see the coiled mainspring and the seven-day power reserve gathering energy underneath the viewing ports. You can also see the silicon disc in the case back to remind you that through its Sigatech subsidiary, since 2006, Ulysse Nardin, uniquely for a smaller brand, makes its own silicon components. Let's throw it on the wrist. Who's joining in the box today? I see right here we've got Mike B joining from Raleigh, North Carolina. We've got Blue Shirt Buddha. We've got M Ranks 22 London Calling right here. We've got lots of friends with Eddie Landsberg apparently joining in from his phone. This man is connected. He's in the studio and he's in the chat box. All right, synchronicity if ever I've seen it. Edward Ledden of Sweden, JBO Surf from Adelaide, Australia, Abu Sadiq, welcome guys. Let's take a look at the freak on the wrist. Now it is an overpowering watch. In rose gold, this is about as Ulysse Nordin as you can get. The timepiece, small enough to wear on a small wrist, but make no mistake, if you're looking to avoid a statement watch, avoid this watch. But what a pleasure. Technically significant, horologically refined, and a manufacturer timepiece distinctive of a brand like none other. This is an icon, not just of its era, but of all time, one of the truly great watches. All right, jumping into the box right here, we've got Javier Tehran joining from Ecuador and South America, and we've got Nation joining from Baltimore, Maryland, and William Fleming from South Philly, my homeboy from the locality. All right, Thomas Burnett and Bear Clooney watches. Let's talk about independent horology. In 2017, Laurent Ferrier of Geneva came out with the Montre École, essentially the school watch of Laurent Ferrier, namesake of the brand, but recreated in a wristwatch format. For 2018, that became an annual calendar, and that's what we have here. Here. The Galet Montre École, 40 millimeters in stainless steel, 12.8 millimeters thick. You can see the sensational double finished satin dial, vertical satin and concentric satin. Note the flourishes of white, red, and blue varnish. An extraordinary watch with an upbeat countenance and an annual calendar. Turn it all over, and you might even say things get better. Laurent Ferrier manufacture caliber 
LF12601 adjusted in six positions, one more than the chronometer standard, 80 hour manual wind power reserve, and look at the execution. There is a gray, almost slate DLC executed on the Cote de Genève, and not all Cote de Genève are created equal. You could see that these are deeply crested, laid down with an abrasive wheel, not stamped. They're darker on one side than they are on the other. That's always the sign of the real deal. Take a look, case back power reserve, a handsome embellishment that's also practical on this manual wind watch, a timepiece in stainless steel that lets you buy the horology without paying the precious metal premium. And I truly adore the Laurent Ferrier brand. Nice people on top of everything else. Let's talk about more of a staple, also from Geneva, but this is the giant of Geneva in one of my favorite forms. A date just, and not just a date just, but with a pink champagne dial and a domed bezel. This is the 116200. You know that the 200s have a domed bezel, which gives the watch a little bit of a neo bubble back look as it completes the bubble like profile of the watch. The dial is fully loomed. It is a sun burst with an exquisite pink tone. It's a pink silver that defies description with the Super Jubilee, all solid links, 100 meters water resistant, automatic and loomed. This could absolutely be your sports watch, even as it has the chops at only 11.6 millimeters thick to be your dress watch, beach to, well, one might say beach to boardroom or bathing suit to tux. This is a timepiece that represents the best of Rolex and it has the same movement as a Submariner, but if you're a bit shall we say larger of wrist and burlier of forearm, or you've just got a different sensibility about your aesthetic preference, this might be more your speed. Rolex Datejust 2, this is the 116333. It's a combination of yellow gold and Rolex 904L steel. Now this is a true gold sunburst dial. It's not champagne, it's not silver yellow, it is gold. It matches the yellow gold tones of the watch perfectly, and it's a big boy spanning approximately 52.5 millimeters end link to end link. This is one for a larger wrist. I can wear it, but I think proportionally I'm a better match for a 36. If your wrist is over 17 centimeters circumference, you want to start thinking about this and unique movement. No other Rolex ever used the caliber 3136. And I'm sorry this watch is covered with stickers. The last guy clearly didn't have the nerve to wear it the right way. Don't be like him. Jumping into the box right here, Bear Clooney watch, beautiful date just, whereas Maison 1 says, and ah, just another Rolex. BS, a fan of the pink dial on the date just 36, and Thomas Burnett, also a fan, calling it more of a salmon tone. I could see right here Edward Ledden saying, everyone is blindly chasing the salmon dial trend. Uh, we've got a big one on the table tonight, I can assure you. And then right here, we've got Adam Dorney saying, picked up a white dial Oyster Perpetual, very impressed with the softness of the white dial. Very few can make a white dial warm, and Rolex is one of the few. Let's jump to another white dial that I find quite becoming. This was one of my favorite watches of 2016, and one of my favorite watches from a brand I love generally. The Vacheron Constantin Quai de Lille. 41 millimeters in stainless steel for 2016, eight years after the first version met a muted response, Vacheron finally got this watch right. Less is more, a three-hand dial with an orbital date index. I'll show you how this one actually works. The orbital date index actually allows you a little bit of a quirk factor on a watch from one of the Doyen brands of high horology. You might even say this is the Doyen, as it is the oldest continuously operating brand in Switzerland since 1755. 41 millimeters, and you can pick this up for about $12,500, one of the best points of entry to Geneva Hallmark watchmaking. And you could see not just Geneva Hallmark on the movement, this is the post-2012 standard, Geneva Hallmark on the case as well. Caliber 5101, immaculate finish, 60 hour power reserve, and take a look, Vacheron vulcanized rubber strap. This is a sports casual watch par excellence with a lovely depth about its grayscale dial and a softness and a becoming white opaline quality that's warmer than the harsh silver sunburst treatment often seen. Now throw this one on the wrist and you can see it's a larger Vacheron at almost 50 millimeters lug to lug. It fills the wrist but at only 12.4 millimeters thick you're gonna see this one wears easily. Yes under a cuff but also proportionally better on a small wrist which is why the Kitalil is one of my absolute favorite Vacheron timepieces. It's bold Old, it's contemporary, it's uncompromised, it's one of their most accessible, and it wears a treat. It's almost like a little piece of the Chrysler building for your wrist. It's of an Art Deco sensibility, and I love that. 
Oh, right. Bolin into the box. Adrian is saying, I'm disappointed by that tungsten rotor. Well, there are some compromises if you're looking to, for a $16,000 retail Geneva Hallmark watch, and it's one of the few compromises, I'll add. Right here, we've got Xavier N saying, VC truly needs more love. That is just beautiful. Man, I am with you on that count. And we've got That's Bod saying the rotor is a letdown. Guys, tungsten, in return for a Geneva Hallmark movement, it's a trade-off I'm willing to make at under $20,000. But your opinion may differ. If I were to criticize that watch, I would say it's not water resistant enough. As I feel a watch like that needs to be more than 30 meters, it needs to be swimmable. Jumping into the box right here, we've got Matt Foster, VC for the PAM lover. Let's talk about a PAM. We've got a Panerai on the table tonight. It's one hell of a machine. A mid-year launch for 2019. This is the Rodimir 1940 a Dizione Verde Militare, 995, the PAM 995, 45 millimeters in steel. Panerai realized back in 2017 that the green dials were hot and they needed to offer them on something other than a Bronzo. The th trend continues. Four mid-year releases this year with green dials. You can see this one wears pretty easily. It's smaller than a conventional Panerai at about 52.7 millimeters lug to lug, but it's still a full-sized watch. And if you look at the dome of that sapphire, it is so thick and so cambered that it creates that off-axis distortion you would get with a vintage plex. I love the dial. It's a true sandwich construction, a stencil over a loomed disc with rose gold hands, but this one is only 14.2 millimeters thick, and that in spite of the crystal. Why is it so thin by Panerai standards? Manufacturer caliber 4000 on the back, twin barrels stacked, automatic. We got another tungsten rotor, guys. I apologize, but this movement with a three-day power reserve and a micro rotor automatic. It is tough with a full bridge and a free sprung index and 100 meters water resistant with what qualifies as an ultra thin case by Panerai standards. I genuinely love this, especially on the minimally tanned Ponte Vecchio strap with that aged coloration about the contrasting stitch. This is a truly great effort from Panerai, a company that is batting increasingly lower in the order to use a baseball metaphor within the Richemont brands. This restores some of the lost luster. I truly adore this watch. Okay, jumping into the box right here, Thomas Burnett is a fan of the PAM Rodimir 1940 range, thinking that green dial is awesome, and then ID guy saying he loves the micro rotor. You, you and me both. Micro rotors are sexy in any form. And then we've got Dante Miami saying, can't get into the 1940s crown. Well, if you look very closely, it's not the 1940 crown. Get very close, and you can see the OP interlocking logo on the crown is not that of the 1940s, but that of 1970s Officine Panerai. But yes, I get the general point. It is the Panerai 1940 case with that crown profile and, of course, the larger, more substantial non-wire Radiomir lugs. All right, let's jump across the border into Germany and see what Deutsche Land hath wrought. This watch came out in 2016, and I remember it well because I was taken by it at Basel World 2016, my first time at Basel, and I saw this, the Glasuta Original Senator Chronometer. White gold, 42 millimeters with a blue varnished grane dial. It is a grained pebble-like texture in a sort of matte lacquer that's achieved at the Forsheim dial factory that Glasuta Original owns. Now, the watch features a power reserve, a day-night indicator, a double-digit twin disc date, you've got small seconds, you've got poive-style hands, or basically pear-style hands. Now look at this. You've got the zero reset system, which is a great hacking system, but did you see the minute hand jump? Because not only does it zero reset the seconds, it zero resets the minutes. And the minute hand jumps in one minute increments, forward or backwards, allowing you to set this watch precisely to a reference time, both to the second and to the minute. Manual wind, turn it over, caliber 5801, as good as it gets in terms of design and finish. You've got a spectacular hand-finished double spiral on the ratchet wheel. Look at the planetary architecture with a black polished spoke set atop, blued screws, you have jewels set in Chaton. You have a black polished cap to the escape wheel and a freehand engraved half bridge for the balance. All of that with a black polished swan's neck and glasuta stripes across a three-quarter bridge. Now let's throw this on the wrist because not only is this an accurate watch, it's a good looking watch and a thin one. 
As I measure it, 12.5 millimeters thick. Effectively, it wears the same as a Rolex Submariner on the wrist. It has a German chronometer certificate. SLME LMET is the certification. This is achieved in Germany. It goes according to the ISO 3159 that governs the COSC, but it is a full watch test, not a bare movement test. The dial on this watch is electrifying. It captures my heart even as the movement captivates my mind. And you can see it's an easy 42 to wear. Jumping into the box. My God, guys, we're up to 238 live, and we're only 15 minutes into the show. Stay with me, guys. Let's see what you have to say. Blue Shirt Buddha, absolutely gorgeous watch. Blue Shirt, you know the watch is the right color for you. We've got Abu Sadiq seconding Brick Lane, and let's see what Brick Lane is saying. That is a beautifully finished Glasuta. Maison 1, gorgeous back. And then Thomas Burnett joining in saying, hey, buddy. Hey, Thomas. Good to see. And we've got... Roy B saying that feature makes my OCD sing. He's talking about the zero reset for the seconds and the minutes. A wonderful refinement. And then Maison asking machine finished stripes not on that watch. Finally, we've got comments along the lines of German watches are some serious stuff from Edward Suave. You know it. On the Zin front, you've got a pure tool watch. Glasuta Original Langa Moritz Grossmann, who, by the way, will be in the studio later this week. You're getting incredible haute de gamme. Let's jump into the box and let's talk about another German watch. Launched in 2007, the Saxonia Langamatic had a 10-year run in its 37 millimeter initial size, and this is a rare example of a tritium dial longa. You will not see many of them. 37 millimeters with the longomatic caliber, you can see where the zero reset system idea came from in German watches. Now, the dial has a lovely sort of if I had to describe it, I would say it's an off-white silver granet. It's not quite silver, and it's warmer for it. You can see the double-digit date is no joke. Let's quickly roll through the date change just to make sure we're not in the danger zone. Okay, we're not in the danger zone. And you have a pusher on the flank that gives you the same tactile sensation of operating a datagraph. The quality of the feel and the sound of the date pusher on a longa is worth the price of admission. So too is the movement. Now here's a different take on German movement finish. Here we've got an automatic but look at the automatic. Not only is the rotor engraved 21 karat gold, but the mass is platinum. So it's gold and it's platinum, and they're hitched together by fire blued screws. Does it get any better than this? It does not. Freehand engraved half bridge, black polished swan's neck, glasuta stripes, and here you can see the bridges are German silver, known as Maichor in the French watch regions. It is a alloy of nickel, copper, and zinc, and it's the copper that gives this movement its intense golden tone. Note the engine turning below the rotor is tighter than the engine turning below the balance. They sweat the details here on this 45 hour power reserve 21 6 beat rate manufacture micro rotor automatic. This thing makes my heart sing. And again on the wrist real quick you can see this is an easy watch to wear. It is under 45 millimeters lug to lug which means there is no lower limit on the size of the wrist for which I would recommend this watch. So guys with small wrists and women who are into high horology batter up. Okay where have we been? We've been through Germany, we've been through Italy by way of Panerai, it's sort of Italian Swiss. It's the Italian sensibility. We've been to Geneva with Laurent Ferrier and Rolex. Let's visit the Valley de Jeu with my original heartthrob, Jeger Le Coult. And this is one hell of a machine. From the Great House. The 2010 200-piece limited edition Amvox 2 Grand Chronograph. Where are the pushers? There are none. There is a locking system on the flank that allows me to lock out the articulated case with which, look, I'm pushing at 12 o'clock. It rolls on ball bearings. The case is assembled in three primary pieces and the case back is cambered to arc over your wrist. The idea is that this is a motorsport style chronograph that you can actuate with your fat gloved finger. No Rolex Daytona screw downs here. The case itself actuates the chronograph and the case itself resets the chronograph. Sapphire discs for hours and minutes. It has instantaneous jumping minutes. There is an Aston Martin constant second 
Perkins indicator down at 6 o'clock, a key difference between this and the original Amvox, which had a quote-unquote dead dial. You can see the grill of a David Brown era Aston Martin. You can see the partially calibrated dial. There are no numerals or indices on the bottom because that's how a Chagere instrument, a tachometer or a speedometer, would appear in a vintage Aston Martin. This is more than a shotgun marriage of luxury brands. This is real history between Chagere and Aston Martin dating back to the 20s. Turn it all over. This is the only truly overt Aston Martin branding on the watch. The dial side winglet, you could almost miss it. And note the engine turning on the base plate just below the skeleton dial. Does this watch have it all? It does. Throw it on the wrist and you can see that, well, I owned the watch in this case size and shape. I owned the original Amvox too, which is dimensionally identical except for the case thickness. This one is thicker, it gives you more gold. The timepiece is easy to wear because it's under 50 millimeters from lug to lug and the case is nicely shaped to arc over your wrist hug your wrist and better enable that articulated pusher system. Now the watch has one of the most handsome straps I've ever seen. You have embossed leather, brogued or stitched atop other leather, and you can see there is a reflective gold material inside on both sides. On the underside, Alcantara, sparing no expense, the premium synthetic suede that you'll find on the contact points as well as headliners of the finest luxury and performance cars around the world. This is a timepiece for the ages and the most innovative chronograph of the 2000s. What makes the Grand Chronograph different from a standard Amvox 2? Well, aside from the limited edition, it is a thicker case. Why? Because the Grand Chronograph was created using leftover cases from the Amvox transponder, the Amvox 2 that could open, lock, or flash the lights and chirp the alarm on your Aston Martin. They didn't get the take rate over four generations of that watch, so they had some cases left over, and this was the result. A truly grand chronograph, and again, a bit chunkier, but more exquisite precious metal for it. Let's talk about a watch that's monstrous but thin. A little bit of a dichotomy, and uncommon. Jumping into the box, let me see, what do we have here? Dave Open Car, wow JLC. I could see crappy luxury though, not a fan. I'll pass on that one. And then we've got Hotsey saying that's a beautiful watch. And then right here we have Luke saying, oh, when will JLC return to innovation and novelties like this? Gyro tourbillons are cool, but JLC can do so much more. And I agree with you, man. The brand is punching below its weight and has been for three years at least. IWC. Often discussed as the brand of the Portugueser, the brand of the Pilot Watch, rarely cited for the Portofino, but the first Portofino in 1984, the giant Portofino, the fried egg, the 5152, set the tone for the return of mechanical watchmaking in Schaffhausen. Truly, it never went away. And this watch in 2008 paid tribute to the giant Portofino. If that one was the fried egg, I like to call this one the moon pie. If you haven't lived in Panhandle, Florida, keep me streaming, open a separate window, Wikipedia Moon Pie. You'll see what I mean. Matte black dial, a 122 year adjustment interval moon face, and you have these exquisite needle style modified Breguet hands in a 46 millimeter steel case that pays tribute to the giant Portofino, but is only 11 millimeters thick. Turn it all over. Oh my goodness. Let's get real close here, Andrew. This is caliber 98800, 18 joules, five position adjustment, pocket watch style, big slow beat balance that's almost one third the 37.6 millimeter diameter of the movement, overcoil hairspring, and the world's largest hacking lever. You can actually see the hacking lever. See it right there? Take a look. You could see it moving into and out of contact with the balance. Manual wind and exquisite. A big chunky pocket watch movement as with the giant Portofino in its caliber 98 and 1984. Now note the exceptional pocket watch style click and click spring. Note how the click, when I wind the watch, note how the click is actually drawn out. It is a spring-loaded multi-part component. As on the pocket watch, it has a large, arcing, swan's neck-like spring. You have the crown wheel, the ratchet wheel over the barrel, the center wheel, the third wheel, the fourth wheel, the escape wheel, and then you can see that big slow beat balance with its handmade overcoil. An extended Jones Arrow index for fine adjustments, three-quarter style pocket watch bridge, and a case study in the flow of power and elemental watchmaking. I love this watch. Throw it on the wrist one more time, and truth be told, at 50.9 millimeters across the wrist, it could have been broader. It could have been tougher to wear for a 46. It's an easy, flat, broad, saucer-like image on the wrist, and yes, it will wear on a wrist as small as 14.5 centimeters. I adore this piece. Sorry, Portugueser, but the Portofino is my favorite IWC dress watch right here. 
And then we've got Karsten Lund saying, I had to Google Moon Pie even though I've lived in Florida. <laughs> I've lived in Pensacola and I've lived in Miami. And they are two different worlds united within one state. Jumping right here, Jason Reeves asking, did I miss the deep sea? No, you didn't, Jason. It's coming right up. I mentioned in the title, Deep Sea Take Two. And truly, this is the redesign for 2018 of a watch that bowed back in 2008. This is the Deep Sea D-Blue Generation 2, the reference 126660. What makes it different? Well, first, a better match between the width of the end link, the bracelet, and the lugs. Now, rather than 22 millimeters on the original watch, the end link is 22. So it went from 21 to 22, meaning it's wider and it's a better match. You don't have the pencil neck effect from before. You also have a narrower span across the wrist. From end link to end link, the original Deep Sea was 55.6 millimeters. This right here is 53.5, so two millimeters narrower across the wrist. I'm sorry to say it's still almost 18 millimeters thick, but trust me, it's worth it. A 5.9 millimeter thick Cyclops free crystal. Look at the distortion caused by that near six millimeter crystal. It sits on a plinth that says at the bottom ring lock system and truly it is. You have the sapphire, you have a solid cylinder, and then you have a case back made of titanium. The only large titanium component in a Rolex watch for mass production. All of that sort of compresses together the ring lock system as the watch descends towards its maximum rated depth of 3,900 meters. Now you will see that there is a gradient to the dial because it is designed to evoke James Cameron's 2012 journey in a submarine known as the Deep Sea Challenger, which was the color of the word Deep Sea. And so you have that gradient, the journey from the surface to the bottom of the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench. The watch critically is not just different in size, from the original Deep Sea and the original 2014 Deep Blue, but it is also a three-day power reserve. Now you get the caliber 3235, so you go from a two-day reserve to a three-day reserve. The watch is still a monster, but it is the most technically advanced Rolex you can buy. And that's not just lip service. There is a lot in the construction of the case, the architecture of the movement, and I should mention Rolex's best clasp. Look at this. The most advanced adjustment system you will find in a Rolex watch, you have this sawtooth-like glide lock system that critically you can engage and adjust while the watch is on the wrist so you will not accidentally drop it. With the conventional Sea Dweller 43 and the sub, you have to take the watch off the wrist to actuate the glide lock system. Here you keep it on the wrist pro style. If you need an additional flip lock fold out, you've got it. It's about two inches of total adjustability. For those who are not in the former colonies, that is about 50 millimeters and it is one hell of a system. The best dive watch in the world and the best bracelet that Rolex makes, this watch exhausts the superlatives. Jason, I hope that settled things about the deep sea as far as you're concerned. We got Roypy saying, I'll admit that bracelet is fire and we've got Medga's guy saying that doesn't look so bad on a small wrist. No, it doesn't really. Honestly, it could be worn if you needed the best dive watch possible. You could wear it comfortably on a small wrist. Now, is it a bit much for every day at the office? Probably, if your wrist is my size. If you have a LeBron size wrist, then it's probably the date just for you. All of which is to say, like everything, it's relative. Okay, jumping into the box, guys. Help me hit 300 concurrent. Eddie, we're up to we're up to 297. We're gonna hit 300. Join in the chat, egg them on. And right here, we've got Adam Dorney saying those JLCs are amazing. I've got another one for you. This was probably the JLC of 2016. Closely related to the famed Doctor Strange, this is the Master Ultra Thin Perpetual Black. The watch came out three years prior, but with the black dial, it takes on an all new dimension of gravity and wrist presence, and that in spite of the fact that it's only 9.2 millimeters thick and 45.5 millimeters from lug to lug, 39 millimeters in diameter, calibered 968, a manufacturer automatic on the reverse side, and yes, it is 50 meters water resistant in spite of being an ultra thin dress watch. Perpetual calendar matte dial, much like the Portofino. You throw this watch on the wrist and oh my god, I love this thing. This is the only perpetual calendar you will ever need. And for a lot of folks, this might be the one you want most as it's graceful. It's universally wearable. It's formal enough to wear black tie, but hell, you could wear this black t-shirt. There's no reason why not. A watch that can dress up and down and one of the best offerings from JLC in the last half decade. That said, there have been a few rays of light from La Grande Maison of the Vallée de Joux. And in 2015, the geophysic universal time hit every single talking point 
for watch nerds. It's beautiful. It's true to history. It's lacquered on the dial. It's machined with raised and relieved metal continents. It's a world time. It's a deadbeat second. It's a wearable 41.6 millimeter case. It has an advanced manufacture movement. And if you look at the Gyro Lab Balance, check this out. The Gyro Lab Balance, see if we can freeze it in a more accessible position. The Gyro Lab Balance features a yoke style architecture. So in other words, it's not a wheel. It's shaped like a yoke. It's shaped like the control yoke of a P38 Lightning. So it's not a continuous annular surface. Each side is shaped like the JL logo of the brand itself. And so you have an aerodynamic balance shaped like two JLC logos underneath a full balance bridge with a free sprung index for shock resistance. You can see the hairspring mechanism that governs the deadbeat second. All of this nicely executed with exquisite Cote de Genève rendered on the gold winding mass and true fire blued screws. Now you throw the watch on the wrist, it is a hand handsome piece. This is a handsome devil. Not an, not a small watch and not a big watch. It's a full-sized watch. Can we get super close to the dial? You can see it's got a, a Lampert projection dial. It's not quite a Mercator projection. And you'll also note just how much nuance there is to this dial. Andrew, I'm going to hold this up. I'm going to let our viewers take a look. First, you could see that it is a gradient lacquer. It fades from blue at its outer edge to almost a silver blue at its center. The continents and the land masses are three-dimensional. They're a satin metal that rises above the dial. You can see there's a candy cane-like demarcation mark that runs straight through the North Pole. And then you have dial side bolts, a la F. P. Journ, on this timepiece from north to south. You'll also note that you have day-night for the 24-hour reference ring, the ability to set the local time separately. I'll demonstrate how the world time system works. And take a look carefully on the inside of the bezel. You can see the small loom dots designed to recall the radium that was fitted to the underside of the plexiglass crystal on the original 1958 JLC Geophysic Technician's Watch. So they truly sweated the details everywhere on every surface surface right down to the applique indices on the lacquered dial center. I adore this watch. I understand the deadbeat second is controversial. I happen to eat it up and this is one of the few recent production JLC watches that I truly love and could see myself owning. Okay, right here we got I think Josh Thanos in the box, an old friend and an alumnus of the watch box and watch you want. Geezer asking, is that quartz? No way. It is a deadbeat second watch, one of the few. It is a conventional 288 beat rate. You can see the balance flying away under its bridge. You can see the hairspring mechanism that creates the deadbeat. This is not a quartz watch. This is a deadbeat. It's often been called the technician or the doctor's complication. Okay, I can see as a case saying that is a great world time and I can see IH saying I want this watch I've been to 50 countries. I want you to have that watch and then right here We've got eh, 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 saying the world time complication must be fun to play with it is and Thomas Von W saying I love deadbeat seconds because people will just assume it's a quartz It's true The guy who spots that watch as a JLC deadbeat is the kind of watch nerd You want to engage in a conversation and take out for a drink and then we got Brick Lane saying quite simply I just don't want a deadbeat watch that's okay, I've got a watch for you that is not a deadbeat in any sense, literal or figurative. This is the frankly absurd 2007 Blancpont 50 Fathoms Huit Jour Flying Tourbillon. The Tourbillon Volant on your wrist, water resistant to 300 meters. This is a flying tourbillon caliber 25 eight day automatic movement originally designed for Blancpain by independent watch maestro and AHCI co-founder Vincent Calabrese, 45 millimeters in red gold as ever with the cambered sapphire atop its diving bezel. Here you get the eight day power reserve, broadsword style hands, all applique rose gold indices, black lacquer dial, and then you have a black polished flying tourbillon carriage beating away at 21,600 vibrations per hour. Turn it all over and it's handsomely rendered. Hand finished movement adjusted in five positions like a chronometer and again eight day power reserve so if this is not an everyday watch for you and frankly I think that goes for most of us you can leave it for a week put it back on next weekend and it's still good to go ready to rock and just as water resistant loomed and legible day or night as a standard 50 fathoms. Throw it on the wrist and well yeah this is the kind of watch that watch brands were making in 2007. The Naughty Audis 
it was a different kind of time. It was the era of 44 millimeter Rolex Deep Seas. It was the era of 48 millimeter Big Bang King Powers. And for that matter, 44 and then 48 millimeter Royal Oak Offshores. But this watch has aged well. While it's over the top, it's over the top the way a Richard Neal is over the top. All of which is to say, if you have the panache and the sensibility to pull it off, it still delivers the goods, both in terms of presence and in terms of fine finish and execution. It's beautiful at the macro and the micro levels, and it still has one head of hell of an attitude problem. In the best possible way. Okay. Detox. I talked about Audemars Piguet going big during the 2000s. Fortunately, Audemars Piguet also went thin extra thin. In 2000, we saw the 15202 debut, still known as the current jumbo. The 15202 has been through some changes of dial and movement and bracelet, but you can see this example pre-2012 features the pre-2012 dial and a lovely flat profile, only 8.3 millimeters thick, 39 millimeters in a monoblock steel case. It wears flat on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. You can see that any Royal Oak wears larger. This is more like a 41 millimeter watch, to be perfectly honest always size down when buying a Royal Oak. Now let me show you some of its tricks of the trade. You could see that like the original Gerald Genta reference 5402 of 1972, and unlike the current 15500, this is a mono block case. The case back is one piece. To load the watch, let me show you how this works, there is a cutout in the case itself. I manicure myself obsessively for you guys and I pay the price as you could see. But there is a cutout in the case, if you look closely, that allows you to lower the stem into place. Everything front loads the dial and the movement into this watch. As ever, you have the hexagonal bezel bolts in white gold, the grand, well, this is actually the petite tapisserie dial, the smallest of the hobnail cuts on a pantograph. Audemars Piguet uses petite tapisserie on the jumbo, grand tapisserie on the standard automatic, and mega tapisserie on the offshore. You could see that this is the pre-2012 because of the shorter indices and the little Arabic numerals outboard, as well as the AP at 12 o'clock rather than 6. And if you look closely, no date disc on this generation of watch matches any version of the dial, including the silver to silver. Turn it all over, and this is where the older watch has the advantage over the new. Caliber 2121, based on the ancient JLC 920 Abausch, you could see that the AP rotor used to be a whole lot more attractive than the ugly milled unit that's on the current 15202. This is freehand, skeletonized, and then beveled. It is a gorgeous rotor for a gorgeous movement, and this is a higher standard of movement finish than you will find on the standard Audemars Piguet watches. That is why production of these watches is precious and scarce. It is the finish of these calibers. And by the way, AP now makes this movement in-house despite its JLC origins. That movement powered the first Royal Oak, the first Nautilus, and the Vacheron 222 of the same era. Kevin S. saying best bracelet in the biz, and I should mention that the jumbo bracelet is a very different animal from what you'll find on a 15400 or 15500. It's thinner, it's more supple, it's more delicate, but it's also more comfortable and more flexible. I find it preferable in every way, because let's face it, if you're going to swim with a watch, you're probably not doing it with any standard Royal Oak. You may as well enjoy the luxury of a hand-finished bracelet that feels like a piece of silk cloth ac across your wrist. And truly, this does. Okay, let's see where we are right now. This is the detour segment of our show where we talk about something completely out of left field. Are you a fan of modern art? Are you a fan of independent horology? How about the Michael Dudon Chapter 3 Jasper Johns Figure 8 Homage Micro Hand Painted this is the image of the Jasper Johns figure eight abstraction, colorful, florid, true, and I'll mention a wonderful cloak for a surprisingly complex watch designed as a watch by Kerry Voudelainen and Andreas Streller. Voudelainen, famous for being, well, Kerry Voudelainen and Andreas Streller, famous for creating the Harry Winston Opus 7. There is a hidden second time zone function. You could see there is a barrel that gives you the AM PM. That too is hand painted. There is a second barrel, a signature of the Michael Dutomp manufacturer, that gives you the second time zone. And you could see as, pull it all the way out, as I roll through the time, the barrel system jumps from side to side 
That is how it handles the 24 hour sequence, two barrels of 12 hours, and the system is seamless. You'll also note the extravagant sword style white gold hands at center, and if you look carefully, there's a moon phase tucked in. Now the watch features the shutter system that is seamless and flush with the dial when you don't want it. I mentioned it's a piece unique, and I'm not kidding, one of one. You can see only one engraved on the locking system that lets you separate and decouple the two time zones. SHC-03, designed by Voodleinen and Streller. It's a 21.6 beat rate overcoil hairspring. You can see the night side of the AM-PM roller and the exquisitely finished movement with a 36 hour manual wind power reserve. And it is a handsome 42 in white gold on the wrist. You can see the timepiece is a little bit bold by the standards of independent horology. This is on the larger side, about 49.5 millimeters lug to lug. The watch is 42 millimeters in diameter. And I need to mention, and you can really see from that angle. The dial is truly hand painted. This is not a transfer or an emulation of some kind. This was executed by a micrometric artist who works in this medium as a matter of course. The timepiece truly exceptional in every way. Three artists, one of them a micro painter, two of them horological, contributed to this opus. All right, jumping into the box right here, we've got Ernesto Guerrero asking, what is the price on that? I can tell you that, because I have the price handy. That is about $55,000, and you are pulling from the top shelf there. It doesn't get any better than Andrea Streller and Carrie Voodleinen, and I've met the people behind the brand. They're a lot of fun. Jumping back into my box, I could see, oh my gosh, that chop box is moving faster than I can read it. I love you guys, but you type way too fast for me. That said, let's slow down with Vacheron Constantin. We had the Kitalil earlier. Let's talk about a completely different style of Vacheron, a more traditional style of Vacheron. Launched in 2002, this is the Malt Perpetual Calendar Retrograde. 39 millimeters in rose gold, 46.5 with those sexy double-stepped flared malt style lugs. You can see there's a hobnail dial and a perpetual calendar system, Vacheron's own perpetual calendar complication, and through the case back, a Jaeger Le Coult 889 automatic base. In the grand tradition of Vacheron Constantin, JLC provides the motive power, Vacheron provides the final finishing, the best of both worlds in that you get a customizable mirror finished hunter style spring loaded case back. You get the Vacheron signature engraved on the reverse side. So you get the precious metal and the solidity of a solid case back and you get the open vista of a display case back with a Vacheron Constantin perpetual calendar. Let's throw this one on the wrist and get a sense. At just over 46 millimeters lug to lug, almost anyone can wear this watch. It has presence. It has personality. It makes itself known. And I have to say that it does so with excellent manners as 39 millimeters is anything but brash, obnoxious, and extrovert. This is a timepiece that proves even a traditionally sized men's dress complication can speak in a stentorian voice. Oh my God, I love that watch. That said, from the other side of Geneva, a competing image of rose gold Let's jump real quick so we can catch the jump of the minute on the Vagabondage 2 from FP Journe. This is a watch made in 68 pieces in rose gold that came out in 2010, the second of the tonneau style case FP Journe Vagabondage alternative time displays. You will note that the watch is 37.5 millimeters wide and only about 45 millimeters lug to lug and only 7.9 millimeters thick, so a very wearable watch. The original Vagabondage was created as essentially an auction piece for the anniversary of Anticorum. And because the movement was originally designed for an F.P. Journe Cartier CPCP watch that never happened, he was designing the movement for Cartier, it had that tonneau shape. But because the original Vagabondage did meet, well, it did not meet his standards for accuracy, he did not put his name on the front. Now that changed with the two and the three, but he maintained the tradition of not putting his name on the front. Look carefully and you can see that the satin finished bridge for the wheels is completely asymmetrical. It catches you by surprise and it sits on a smoked sapphire that barely allows you to see the registers when they're not in their frames, but does allow you to see the exquisite double sized engine turning of the base plate of the caliber 1509, which I should mention, is solid gold. 
Does this watch have it all? It does. Throw it on the wrist and anyone can wear it. Thanks to the slender profile and the compact dimensions across the wrist, I can recommend this for both male and female high horology and independent horology aficionados. So how the hell do you top that? My God. Well, it's going to have to be impressive. It's going to have to be complicated come from a great brand. Since we're talking Geneva watchmaking, how about a great house of the mother city of high horology? Well, how about the 2018 Patek Philippe 5270P? Boom, just like that. I had a request for this watch on Watches Live and I'm delivering. The exquisite salmon dial, the blackened hands as well as numerals, the grain which is neither bright nor dull. It glows softly with a warmth that defies its platinum case. This is white metal done with heart. This is a timepiece that endears itself despite its patrician origins. This is a hard watch to hate and an easy watch to love. 41 millimeters and only 12.7 millimeters thick. Turn it all over and you could see why a lateral clutch column wheel chronograph is the choice if you want the most beautiful, not the most sophisticated, but the most beautiful movement. That's what we have right here. Take a look as I disengage the chronograph. You could see the double jeweled lateral clutch move away, re-engage it, you can see it move back into contact, black polished column wheel cap, note this is a modern Patek caliber and it does feature hacking seconds, manual wind, 65 hour power reserve, 4 hertz beat rate, over coil hairspring, adjusted in a chronometer busting 6 positions, let's reset everything, I'm going to disengage and I'm going to reset, watch the hammers fall on the heart cams at center, there is a Paul based instantaneous minute jumping system and all of this contained in a watch that almost anyone can wear. This is as good as it gets. Patek Philippe, I understand you're all about the Nautilus these days. I understand you're all about steel these days. I understand you're all about bracelets these days. But my god, when you go outside your comfort zone and you look to your history, you can hit the bullseye. And that's exactly what this watch is. As good as it gets by request. Guys, thanks to everyone who joined in. Um, I want to canvas the field. Watch is live. Now it's 7 a.m. on Wednesday or live at 6 p.m. It's usual time on Tuesday nights. I'm thinking of recording the show and airing it on Wednesday mornings at 7 a.m. so everyone can catch it at the same time. You guys let me know in the comments what you think. As ever, thanks to you, thanks to my crew, thanks to Eddie Landsberg for sitting through this whole goddamn thing in an 85 degree room. And thank you for logging on.